Good evening, ladies as well as gentlemen. Papa Boris here with another chess game. This one was played between Friedrich Samish and Aaron Nimsevich in 1923. Now, this is the immortal Zuxwang game, or Zuxwang game, depending on what pronunciation you prefer, and I can say that without giving away who won. Both players were very strong in the 1920s. Samish was one of the world's top players. He also made some important contributions to opening theory. Uh, there's a couple of lines of his that are still played today. And Aaron Nimsevich was the author of one of the most influential chess books of all time. In fact, according to some people, the most influential chess book of all time, My System. He rather revolutionized a lot of ideas in chess, particularly in the opening. So both were very strong players. And let's take a look at how this game turns out. By the way, if you don't know what a Zuxwang is, that's okay. This will be a great game to learn because this is pretty much the best one that ever happened in chess. Samish playing white, third with d4, and Nimsevich uh, re replied with knight to f6. This is the Indian game. And after c4, e6, Nimsevich invited Samish to play the Nimso Indian, which is indeed named after him. This occurs if white plays knight to c3, and then black plays bishop to b4. Now, one of the common ideas in this opening is that black will exchange the bishop voluntarily for the knight, giving white doubled pawns. The lack of this knight on c3 also weakens white's control of e4. So after something like this, and black parking his bishop here, um, black has kind of an iron grip on the e4 square, and it's going to be very difficult for white to make this freeing move e4. Uh, it's not that this position is better for black or anything. It's a playable position for both sides. But uh, this is sometimes a very active opening, and uh, maybe Samish wanted to keep things quiet. He played knight to f3 instead of knight to c3, which is called the anti nimzo Indian, because it stops that bishop to b4, knight pin, and the trade resulting in the doubled passed pawns. So here, um, Nimsevich decides to play b6, which is something that he was very famous for. He really popularized the use of the fianchetto to develop the bishops along the long diagonals, and Samish does the same thing. Now, after Nimsevich plays bishop to e7, here Samish plays knight to c3, developing the knight in a natural place and controlling some center squares. Now that Nimsevich has already put his bishop on e7, it would be a waste of time to put it to b4. It's kind of like he gives away a move to move the bishop twice like that. So he doesn't do that, he just castles, and Samish castles, and then we have d5. So Nimsevich breaks open in the center. Here, probably the best move would have been just to capture and release this tension straight away, let uh, the, the files open up. Now white would have this semi-open c file for the rook. It's not, you know, like terrible for black or anything, but that might have been better than what Samish did, which was play knight to e5. This is a centralizing move, but the knight can be challenged and doesn't really achieve all that much. Now Nimsevich decided to leave knight where he was and play c6. This is another one of Nimsevich's popular ideas, overprotection. You'll notice that there are three pieces, two pawns and a bishop, all protecting this key central pawn on c5. Um, for more on that, you can read my system. The engine actually doesn't really like this position for black very much. The engine would prefer to play knight d to d7 and challenge white's knight in the center immediately, but uh, c6 is probably an okay move. Now here, Samish probably should have just played e4 and gotten this in while the going was good, because that was the weakness of black's last move. When black pushed this pawn to c6, he blocked the light-squared bishop's control of e4, and this gave white a brief window in which to actually make this freeing move and get this pawn out there. But Samish was playing pretty timidly, so he decided to capture on d5. This pretty much gives up any advantage white may have had, resulting in a more or less dead equal position. One of the principles in chess is that whenever there's tension between two pieces, you should keep the tension unless you have some reason to resolve it. And here, white doesn't really get anything at all for making this exchange other than giving black an extremely well-protected pawn in the center that controls this e4 square under lock and key. And there's not much compensation for white to be had as the, uh, in exchange for giving black these nice advantages. So Samish decided to play bishop to f4, just developing his piece, and now Nimsevich played a6. So Nimsevich's plan is to play a6 and then b5. This is a very common theme in a lot of openings. The idea is that it gives black some space on the queen side, and also this b pawn could eventually be pushed again perhaps to b4, dislodging this knight and then weakening, whoops, 
this and weakening white's control of these E center squares. The engine is not the world's biggest fan of A6, but this is an okay plan for sure. After white plays rook to c1, putting his rook on this open file, which is where a rook loves to be, Nimsvish continues on with c5, which, is what, which was his plan all along. And now white plays queen to b3. Perhaps a better decision would have been to move this knight away from e5 and try to get it to c5, where it could challenge this bishop. And if black doesn't want that bishop to get lost to the knight, then he would have to, from c5, you know, exchanges dark squared bishop for it. But Samish was happy with his knight on e5 and he played queen to b3, and now uh, Aaron played knight to c6, challenging this central knight. And again, his position is pretty much equal here. And Samish missed an opportunity to spice things up a little bit. You know, the old saying, spice things up or get out of the kitchen, right? He could have taken on d5 with the knight. This is a bit of a temporary peace sacrifice, because if black takes on d5, then white actually grabs the knight on c6, which is unprotected. And so now white is just up a pawn. The knight on d5 does not have to be captured right away, however. Black's best response would be knight takes d4. And after white exchanges the knight for the bishop with check, and black takes the knight, and white moves the queen, and black moves the knight, white could actually initiate an endgame here where because white does already have a rook on an open file and his knight is centralized and black's bishop is hanging and he has to do something about it, white would be very, very slightly uh, advantaged, but this would be a game. Samish perhaps didn't want to go for an end game or he didn't want to basically take Nimzovich head on in the end game. Nimzovich was known as a very strong end game player, so he didn't make this move. He didn't uh, capture on d5. Instead, he captured on c6, he just exchanged knights. And after the bishop recaptures, Samish again could have made a little tactic. He could have moved knight to e4, which opens up an attack on the bishop on c6. And after black takes and white takes, again, white's got this nice rook on the file and he can double up rooks shortly. This is a roughly equal position. Um, but Samish again decided not to go for it, not to do anything too spicy. He just went h3. Now at this point, Samish is officially giving the game into putting putting the game into Black's hands, or at least putting the ball in Black's court. Because while H3 may have some ideas behind it, it's a very slow move at best, and that's that's a generous way to call it. I mean, you could definitely say this is a do nothing move, uh, but even if there is some idea behind it, it's it's going to be slow. So Samish is basically saying, "Hey, Black, you know, you do whatever you want." And what Nimzovich decides to do is play queen d7, a very logical move. It connects the rooks. This is a common theme. Oftentimes in chess, you just want your rooks in the back rank to be connected so that they can begin to challenge the open files. And now Samish plays king to h2. I'm not exactly sure what the idea behind this was. Uh, maybe Samish wanted to push f4 at some point, not worry about his king on g1. Maybe he wanted to put a rook on h1 and try to go for some kind of an attack, but any of these things are very, very slow in the making. They're very long in the tooth. So again, he's just letting Nimzovich have his way with him. Nimzovich decides to continue with knight to h5, which threatens not only to exchange the knight for the bishop, but also to screw up white's pawn structure, because then these pawns would be doubled. Um, so Samish is like, no thanks, and he plays bishop to d2. And here, Nimzovich gave Samish one last chance to have an equal game. Nimzovich played f5, which is logical enough. It does increase black space on the king side and lock the e4 square permanently. So that could have been a reason to you know, move to h5 as well, is to get this pawn pushed and maybe even put the knight back and move her to e4 or something. But this would have allowed white to play knight to b1. And with knight to b1, as strange of a move as that looks, white actually stopped black from pushing before because the bishop and the queen are both protecting that square. And then white could have potentially untangled himself later on. So if black had played something like a5 to determinedly get that push in, white could have played queen to f3 and kicked this knight after the knight moved. White could have played bishop to f4, and this would have been a pretty equal position. White would have freed himself from his log jam, and eventually, at some point, he could have, you know, played knight to d2 and gotten his knight back into the thick of things. But, unfortunately for Samish, he missed that opportunity, and he played queen to d1 instead. This is a very misguided move, strategically. 
What Samish probably was thinking is that this knight on h5 is undefended, and the queen is indirectly attacking it. So maybe Samish was thinking that he could push this pawn to e4 and then get away with it because this knight would be attacked by the queen. Unfortunately, this move allows black to play b4, and now this knight has nowhere to go, so it has to go all the way back to b1. And the difference between letting black push b4 and then putting your knight to b1 versus the variation I showed a moment ago, which had white putting the knight on b1 voluntarily, is that when white put the knight on b1 voluntarily with the queen on b3, this prevented black from getting this push in, and then black could kind of get the ball rolling on, uh, or sorry, then white could get the ball rolling on unraveling his position. But as it is, black now, because he vacated the square b5 by pushing the pawn, has put his bishop on b5. So you can see it's very important not to let black push that b5 pawn, because once it is pushed, the bishop goes there, and now the bishop pinning this pawn to the rook. So now Samish has to move his rook to g1, which he does before he can consider pushing this pawn. But this bishop here versus being on c6 is a really huge difference. Because now, Nimzovich saw that Samish was planning to go e4 with this tactic on the knight, but he just didn't care. He played bishop to d6, improving his bishop, and after Samish played e4, Nimzovich just didn't give a crap. He just took on e4 with the pawn, exposing the file for his rook, and giving up the piece. Samish did have one last chance here. Instead of playing e4, although he's definitely in a worse position, he had one last chance to avoid losing outright, which was to play bishop to f3. This attacks the knight, forcing it to move. And after it moves, the white bishop can come out to f4. The knight's no longer here to gobble it up, and it ain't great, but then maybe white can put his knight on d2 and unravel the position. But instead, with e4, Samish allowed Nimzovich this tactic of sacrificing the knight on h5, which Samish took, and then Nimzovich played rook takes f2. And now white's in kind of a bind. He really can't move any of his pieces. Uh, this bishop moves, the rook will take on b2. This knight has no place to move because the pawn is controlling all of its squares. The bishop's pinned to the king. Uh, the f1 square is blocked by this bishop thanks to this really clutch push of the pawn to b4. So the rooks of white can't challenge black's rook, which is deep inside of enemy territory. At this point, white's probably going to lose the game no matter what he does, but white chose a particularly quick way to lose. He played queen to d5, and now Nimzovich just doubles up rook on the f-file, and then Nimzovich, or sorry, Samish played king to h1. Basically a do-nothing move. Samish at this point just didn't really know what to do, and he's just saying, all right, Nimzovich, if you can find a way to break through my fortress, then have at me. Nimzovich played rook 8 to f5, attacking the queen, and after the queen moved to e3, Nimzovich completely strangled the queen with bishop to d3. So now the queen doesn't have anywhere to go. It is worth noting that there was another thing that Nimzovich could have done. He could have played rook to e2, attacking the queen. And now the queen has only one move, which is to b3. But then black can move bishop to a4, and now white's queen is completely trapped, and uh, there's just no saving it. So that was an option, but I think chess history, you know, will forgive Nimzovich for his decision to play bishop to d3 instead, because this is still absolutely winning. It's now threatening rook to e2, completely strangling white's queen. Samish blocked this by putting his rook on e1, but now Nimzovich played one of the softest and most genius moves in chess, simple h6. Believe it or not, even though this position looks totally normal, Samish at this point, after this humble pawn push on the other side of the chessboard, resigned, because the game is over. Why is that? Well, that's what a Zuxwang is, ladies and gentlemen. A Zuxwang is a position in which it seems like everything's fine, and there's no like threat that you're facing, you're not like about to lose or anything, but any move that you make worsens your position. So it's like you're forced to make a move that makes you lose, even though if it weren't your move, you'd be kind of holding things together. Right now, um, white has a lot of pieces, and that's what makes this game so memorable. Normally, Zuxwangs happen in the endgame with only a few pieces per side, but white has all of his pieces still. He's only lost one knight. He's got the queen, both rooks, both bishops, and yet nothing can move. This knight has nowhere to go. Every space is blocked. This bishop can only go to one place, b1, and if it does so, then black just takes the knight on b1, which is unprotected, because the bishop blocks the rook's protection of the knight. Okay, so you can't move the knight or the bishop. You can't really move this bishop on g2. It only has one square, which is to go to f1. 
but this is actually unprotected. Uh, black can just take it, and there's two rooks supporting it, and there's only two of white's pieces attacking it, so it's just a free piece. If Samish tries to move this rook on e1, then we have the threat that was talked about earlier. Black can play here, trapping white's queen. And this move has nowhere, this rook has nowhere to go. It goes to f1, it just gets gobbled up. Now, the only other piece that can move is the king. But if you move the king here, then there's actually a really interesting tactic that becomes available, which is rook 5 to f3. And now, after the bishop takes the... Uh, sorry, now, now, now because the king is on h2, it is pin, uh, the, the white bishop on g2 is pinned, so it is impossible to capture on f3, and this way the white's queen is trapped. And notice that in this variation, it's significant that the white queen cannot go to the g5 square, because the pawn on h6 protects the g5, it controls that square. So that's why Nimzovich played h6, it was actually to control g5 in this one variation, when white's king pins the bishop and prevents the bishop from taking the rook on f3, trapping white's queen. Now, as for pawn moves, if white goes, oops, if white goes a3, then black can just reinstate the rook's wing with a5, and nothing has changed. And the only other active pawn move is g4, but notice the weakness of the last move, g4 opens up this bishop on the diagonal. And so now black can again actually play rook 5 to f3, trapping white's queen. And at this point, if you take the rook, you just get checkmated, thanks again to this bishop now having access to the h2 square. Uh, the other moves that white could make, b3 or h4, are basically do-nothing moves, and so black can just sit and wait, and then this looks like is reinstated. So there's absolutely no way for white to avoid losing material, and then shortly thereafter, the game. Thus, Samish resigns. I hope you enjoyed this game. Please like and or subscribe if you did, and I'll see you again soon. Take care.